we just thank you. We thank you for everyone, Lord, who's joined with us tonight. You said in your word that there is a blessing when we learn your Torah. So tonight I ask that your anointing will just flow out of Ken as he's ministering tonight. And Lord, that as we listen, we are going to all grow and mature in you. And we're going to advance, Lord, in your kingdom. And we thank you for it in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Well, once again, thank you for joining us. Quick announcement. If you're coming to um, the congregation on Saturday, please remember, come to the 10 o'clock it's usually 10 30 but come 10 o'clock because it's a special day and i know judy will be happy for me to announce that and please nobody come to the 8 30 service mm -hmm. because we're going to have something special at the 10 o'clock service do your best to get there on time um, i know it's going to be a great day well we're going to get right into the torah portion uh, this torah portion is called vaishlak and it means and he sent and it, it has to do with um, jacob leaving um, Laban's house, and he left there. If you remember the last, the end of the last Torah portion, he's when he's about to leave, he's uh, he sees two company of angels, two camps of angels, um, and it's very interesting because the Torah portion, the way it starts off, is after he sees two camps of angels, then um, the, the scripture is going to say, um, it, and it's in the Hebrew language that he actually is sending angels to let Esau know that he wants reconciliation. It's like, mm -hmm. he wasn't, and one of the most interesting parts of this whole story um, is that when God told him to leave Laban's house and go to Bethel, you never hear God specifically say, okay, I want you to go first and stop at Esau's. I want you then go to, to Shechem um, or, or and, and then go to Bethel. He doesn't say that to him, but for some reason, Esau feels like it's, I mean, excuse me, Jacob feels like now it's time for me to get it right with my brother. And I think this is very important. I think it's powerful because I think we have a lot of scripture that mm -hmm. talks about, you know, uh, when you're going to pray before the Lord, um, first reconcile um, with somebody on the, on the um, horizontal, you know, before we go vertical to the Lord, reconcile first on that horizontal level. And we mm -hmm. know that on the wicked lamp, the separation of brothers is like the, it's the seventh abomination of the wicked lamp. It's the worst thing to be separated from your brother. Mm -hmm. So here to see that Jacob's heart of reconciliation almost is like saying, okay, he's not the same Jacob. Right, 20 years right, earlier right. when he went into Laban's house. Yeah. And so then in, in, in the Hebrew, it says he sends Malak um, to, to Esau. Now, and he's sending, he's sending the, the angel. And it's, in the Hebrew, it's the word for angel. Hmm. Um, and many Hebrew translations will say it is angels. When you do a lot of regular traditional translation, they will change it to messengers. Um, but it's very likely that um, that he actually sent angels to go and let Esau know that he sent them to Mount Seir where Esau was. Um, and, um, and, and he sent them for the purpose because he wants reconciliation. And one of the things he tells the angels to tell Esau, he says, tell him, tell my brother, I've been with Laban for the last 20 years and I've been delayed um, from coming to you. And it's a, an interesting word because it, in the Hebrew, it's, it's, um, it's, it's Strong's 8309. It means I've loitered. I've been behind by implication. I've been procrastinating. And mm. you can see this would make a lot of sense because if you flee, if he fleed from Esau 20 years earlier, the last thing he wants to do is to confront yeah. Esau. So right. yes, he's a he's one, he's procrastinating. He's yeah. uh, it's it's to linger. It's literally the word to linger or to yeah. to delay or tarry longer. Um, and and I think this is a very interesting word because this word actually pops up a lot um, in the Torah when it comes to vows. It says it says the scripture says don't linger or don't delay when it comes to paying your vow or doing something you promise. It says, don't linger, don't right. delay. And if, right. then if you really think about the life of Jacob, one of his issues, and probably one of the reasons he has what's called Jacob's trouble, what is mm -hmm. because he is 
procrastinating. I, I don't know who this is for. Maybe it's for nobody, but maybe maybe it's for all of us to take a look. It's like, am I procrastinating? Am I tearing in a pl- in um in a situation longer and letting it fester or letting it? I'm not dealing with it. And look at the look at what we're learning from. Jacob finally said, I'm no longer going to linger. I'm no longer going to akar delay. I'm going to confront my brother. I'm going to make the I'm going to do my part to reconcile with him. And I think this is what the scripture says. Do whatever you can as long in your power Mm -hmm. to live at peace and to be at peace with your brother. So let's, and let's look at some of the things he said, Genesis 32, five and six. He also commanded them saying, this is what you should say to my Lord, to Esau. This is what your servant Jacob said. I've been staying with Laban and have lingered until now. Now I've come to possess oxen and donkeys flocks male servants and female servants i sent word to tell my lord in order to find favor in your eyes so he's he's letting esau know i want reconciliation i've been with laban um and look at the language though he says he two times he uses the word my lord to describe Esau. I think Mm -hmm. this is powerful. I think this is important because he knows deep down Esau was the rightful uh, firstborn. Mm -hmm. He, um, and he did not do Esau the correct way. And he's using the word Adon, which is um, where we get Adonai from, which is Mm -hmm. the sovereign, the Lord. He's basically humbling himself. I want you to see how he's, he's humbling himself. He's letting him know, you know, um, I've been here for 20 years and God's blessed me and I need favor now. I want you to, you know, I have acquired some things and I think he was letting Esau know, I'm going to, I'm going to do you right. I'm going to bring you a gift. I think he's letting him know that. Um, So he's hoping that Esau is going to receive his word. You know, he's saying master. And then he says, uh, um, uh, I'm your sir. Basically, another time he says, um, uh, I'm, I'm your servant. I need favor. And it's a, it's, it is the Hebrew word chen, for favor. So this is really powerful. Mm. Um, I think Jacob is proving by what he's doing that he's ready to put his past behind him. And, and like, and I think we all can think about that. We Sometimes you just need to put your past in your past, but right. the only way you can do that is you have to confront your past. Mm-hmm. And, um, and and he's letting Jacob, uh, Esau know, if you will, like, I'm not a deceiver anymore. I'm, I'm telling you, this is what's going on right now. He's like being totally truthful. I think this is like, and I know yeah. this is a model that uh, the Jews actually use for reconciliation or how to get along in a in a nation they use this scripture um and they use and they read it and they study it before they're going to deal with an enemy and they're saying like okay look what jacob did let's try to do everything in our power Mm -hmm. um on in on the natural level Mm -hmm. to reconcile i think this is powerful now unfortunately it looks like and just at first appearance this is the way it looks like it's like okay as soon as those angels or maybe messengers came to esau they came back with word to jacob and he says oh by the way now esau's coming yeah you said you said you were coming to him yeah. guess what he's coming to you and he has 400 men with him so it kind of looks like okay maybe it's not going to go well mm-hmm. maybe Esau's going to take be- revenge i mean act- after all i did deceive him so uh, when you say he has 400 men 40 think about it 40 in the bible is the number for trials for testing, because you remember that even Yeshua was tested. Israel was in the wilderness for 40, 40 years. It's a, yeah. it's a testing, but yeah. it's also the number for, for, for purification. Oh, okay. So if you think about when the woman would give birth to a son, it would be, they would be purified for 40 days. For a, yeah. for a girl, it would be 80 days. So you see that number. And then 10, so 40 times 10 is 400. So 10 is a number that can, it can infer to judgment. It can infer to a to law, but it also can be a remnant. Mm. It can be a tithe. It can be a, a minimum congregation or a ruling body. Any way you look at it, the way Jacob reacts is he is he's afraid. And he's not just afraid, he's 
absolutely terrified. Yeah. Now we know the script. He might not have known this, but we know God is not what giving us the spirit, spirit of, of fear, fear, right? But right. he probably, you know, he had Esau. Um, he knew his brother. He, Esau's <laughs> now on his heels. You know, he yeah. was the he's the healer. He's the the person that known for his heel. And now Jacob's uh, Esau's coming uh, and going to be on on Jacob's heels. So let's read a little mm -hmm. bit. Let's look about um, now. What is he going to do? It's very interesting, and I, I love this. First, he he does um, the natural things, but then he goes right to prayer. Mm. So look in Genesis 32, 10, 13, and he's talking to God. I know I am not worthy of even a little of all the loyal love and faithfulness you have shown to me, your servant. You have already blessed me because I left home and crossed the Jordan with nothing except my staff. Now I have grown into two large camps. Rescue me now, please, from the hand of my brother, from the grip of Esau. I am afraid that he might come and crush us all, the children alongside their mothers. Remember you told me I will make good things happen for you and make your descendants as many as the grains of the sand on the shores, which are too numerous to count. So even from his prayer, you can actually see that mm -hmm. Jacob is um, thinking about really what was going on in the very womb of his mom because remember they were there was a trying one was trying to crush the other right. and now he says that now now he's really going to do it mm -hmm. um and but he exactly. prays and what i love what he does is he reminds god of his promise mm -hmm. and i think this is this is also the model of prayer that um yeah. in the jewish prayers but it's the christian prayers we what do we do remind me of my word remind yeah. god of his word and he said Rem I, lord i remember you appeared to me you know when, when i was slept, sleeping on that rock as a pillow and you told me you're mm -hmm. going to treat me well and you said you're going to bring me back to my father's right. house in peace and you're going to protect me and you you, you said you're not going to leave me until you did everything you promised me so what is he doing he's reminding god of his word even though he's afraid he's still operating in faith and yeah. prayer and i think you know, sometimes you have to do it afraid. You have to pray afraid. Mm -hmm. You might feel it in your soulish realm. You're afraid or your your fleshy, your flesh is rising up and you're scared. But go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, you told me this. Lord, you yes, promised me this. Yes. I'm reminding you of your word. This yes. is what your word says. And, um, and, and that's what he did. And then he also divided the, the, the company, all mm -hmm. that he had, he divided into two camps. Now, my thing, what I'm thinking is, what I'm just getting out of that, he left Laban, he saw the two camps of angels, and, and I think he's thinking, maybe God is giving me a strategy. Yeah. Divide my company now in two camps. I think also prophetically, it mm -hmm. could be pointing to the, the two houses of Israel in the future mm -hmm. that God is saying, listen, mm -hmm. the, the houses might be divided, but there's angels for each house. I've got my, I'm, I'm, I'm watching over each house and yeah. I've got, I've, I've got to take care of them. Then he also puts a large space um, between and it's a very powerful understanding of that word space because the word space in the Hebrew can mean enlargement but also can mean relief and it's this it's only used two times in the Bible it's used when Mordecai tells um, Esther he says if you remain silent at this time because remember there's a decree to kill the Jews and right. basically and they're dealing with the descendant of Esau, by the way. Mm -hmm. And he says, if you remain silent, then there will be an enlargement. It's the same word be, or a space and deliverance or a snatching away for the Jews. It will come from another place. And even the word place is makom, which we studied about Wednesday, the place. Mm -hmm. There will be, God will bring from the place, which really is from his place, from yeah. the place where God is. He will bring, and so God gave, I believe, Jacob, a strategy of a space, and the space was like made the, the gifts because there's basically, if you count, there's nine different types of animals mm -hmm. that he's giving um, Esau. giving Esau, and he's dividing them by spaces, by large, so it makes it look like the gifts are larger, so that's right. why one of the understandings of that word is to enlarge. But it's also, um, it's that space in between, that respite or that that quiet in between that's like, okay, God's going to do something here. Now, I saw something that I, I, I'll just bring to your attention. Um, I think that those nine gifts mm -hmm. that he brought divided by those space, I believe the nine gifts 
point to the gifts of the spirit. Yeah. There are exactly nine gifts of the spirit. And when you operate in the gifts of the spirit, there is an enlargement. Yeah. There's an expansion. So I also believe there, it also ties in with the fruit of the spirit. There's actually nine fruit of the spirit. You, you can't make this stuff up. Um, and mm. when you operate, and this is what is Jacob really going to do when you think about it in all his actions, right. he is getting a downloads from heaven but he's yeah. also operating in the fruit of the spirit. He's not living by his nephesh. No. He's not living by his heel. He's living by his, his closeness to God, by his spirit man, if you will. That's good. He divides his, he, he divides his, uh, each wife, um, even the servant wives, he has a certain order. He puts a servant a wives first with their kids. And then, Leah. Uh, then Lee, uh, then Leah with her kids. And then the last one, it, it, you see it, it, the language changes. Joseph is actually standing in front of mm -hmm. Rachel. Very prophetic, very powerful. But mm -hmm. um, um, so that's what's going on before he actually meets Esau. Something happens at night. He ha when all the camps are ahead of him, when his, his family's not with him, and the Bible says he is left alone. Yeah. Something there's an encounter, there's something supernatural that mm -hmm. happens. We're going to read it. We don't have all the understanding of it because it's it's something we could talk about from now to Jesus <laughs> comes and until Jesus gets here and explains it to us fully, we're probably not we can say, well, is it this? Was it this? And, and you'll see what I'm talking about in a moment. Let's read in Genesis 32, 24 through 30. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou, hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, tell me, I pray thee thy name. And he said, wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Penel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Okay. So like this is right before mm -hmm. he is going the next day, Esau is going to show up and all that's going to go down where, where the, um, I don't, I don't know. I think I have uh, where all the different droves by spaces, they're going to come forth. And, and here it says that he's wrestling with an angel and with, with, a, it's actually doesn't say an angel. It says he wrestled with a man in the Hebrew. It's the word ish. It's a man. That's what it says in the Hebrew. It's a, it's a man. But at the end, mm -hmm. it says, uh, I, 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 I've seen God face to face in my life. So it's like, is it a man? Mm -hmm. Is it God? Um, so who's he wrestling with? Is, is it some kind of an angel? Is it God himself? Is it Satan? Because these are all theories. I'm just giving you some serious. Is it Jacob's soul? Or is he really wrestling with a part of himself? Is, it, is he wrestling with his soul or fleshly nature? Is he wrestling with Esau's angel? These are all different understandings. And it could be all of them. It could be none of them. But yeah. I think God's in the, I think we can learn from this encounter. He's encountering, he's definitely, there's a struggle. There's a grappling. It, it actually, um, it's the, it's the word it says when they wrestled, it's, it's the word, the root word means to float away as vapor, um, to bedust, to grapple, to wrestle. So when the, their men are wrestling it, on the ground, the dust, it mm -hmm. comes from the dust, this word, they're wrestling and there's dust flying from the air. And I think it's a wrestling over his humanity. It's a wrestling over, it's like, am I, am I that heel grabber? Am I that deceiver? Am I that same man that mm -hmm. stole uh, my brother's birthright, that, that deceived my father who was blind? Am I that man or have I been changed? And so yeah. in this wrestling, it's mm -hmm. in this wrestling the angel or the 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 man or it's obviously it's not a regular man um it's some supernatural being it they are here's one of the things that i want you to think about it it's almost like an like an equal match mm -hmm. because they wrestle all night long think about this 
from the night to, to the right to right before the break of day. The break of day was when angels normally would have to depart and go and worship at the throne of God. He said, let me go. I have a job to do. I can't stay here any longer. So there's something going on there. And so here's what I'm, what I'm thinking is like, uh, he's almost like wrestling his twin, mm -hmm. his equal. It makes sense. There's somehow it's tied to his brother Esau. I'm wrestling my brother Esau. I'm wrestling. Am I? I'm wrestling the the. It's like I'm wrestling the old me and the new me. Who's going to win? And it's like an equal battle. And so finally, this ish, this man, touches the thigh. The hollow of Jacob's thigh. Now, when you think about it, it's the exact same place that Abraham, when he commanded his servant to go find a wife, he said, put your hand where? Under, Under. my thigh. The, that place is the place of covenant. Mm. And I think there's something it's like, it's like, Jacob, are you going to be a man of covenant? Or is that going to weaken? Is that going to shrink up on you? Mm -hmm. Are you going to, are you going to, um, are, are you going to have to walk with a limp mm -hmm. totally you know, walk um and and but here okay so i'm seeing all these things i don't understand it all and maybe some of you might have some other understanding so but this is what they so at the end the bible says that even when that angel or man touched that part of jacob's thigh and he was in a weakened state you know think about what the scripture says when I am weak, he's weak in the yeah. flesh, but his spirit was so strong, strong yeah. that he prevailed. Yeah. And he said, now, yeah. Jacob, now you won. You prevailed over your flesh. You prevailed over your Esau. You prevailed mm -hmm. over Satan. You prevailed even maybe the Jews would say over the evil inclination. You prevailed and you have become Sarah. You're a prince. It's the same word as uh the, the yeah. name of, of his grandmother sarah mm -hmm. sarah el you're a prince with god and then so i think this is powerful this is amazing because mm -hmm. now jacob knows and now jacob knows god's gonna confirm his word yes. he had a per an, uh, he had like yes. a, it sealed it if you will he says now say pastor why are you saying that because he, because he changed his name. He changed his name. Mm -hmm. And that and he needed to have that name change. He needed to have that identity change. And so I think it's powerful. It's amazing. He says in Genesis 32, 28, just go ahead and read these. Okay. Scriptures. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob. Be called it, no more Jacob. But it, for as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. Hosea 12, 3. He took his brother by the heel in the womb and by his strength. He had power with God. All right. I don't know what's going on. Okay. Hold on a second. I got it. All right. Um, Did so, you want to read that? So, so, so he prevailed. He got the victory. Um, and then if you keep reading in Genesis 32, 26, look what he says. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. So I want you to see that Jacob is saying, I am going to get what God has for me, but yes. this time I'm going to get, I think this is the difference. This time I'm not getting it from my brother. Mm -hmm. This time I'm not getting it even from my father. This time I'm not going to let you go, God, unless yeah. you bless me. That's what, uh, yes. what I'm seeing here. Keep going. Mm -hmm. And Jacob, and Jacob asked him and said, tell me, I pray thee thy name. And he said, wherefore is it that thou just ask after my name? And he blessed him there. Okay. So even though we're not sure what this encounter exactly is, and, and maybe it's um, sometimes when something is, um, you're not sure about something in the Bible. Uh, it, it, you can't figure out exactly, is it this? Is it that? Um, if, if some kind of anomaly, and I think this is kind of like, mm -hmm. because he looks like he's a man. And then at the end, he's like seeing God face to face. And then you have this, this person actually blessed him. Well, that's interesting that he got a blessing from whoever this is. So, mm -hmm. okay. Sometimes we have to just say, okay, Lord, there's probably multiple understandings yeah. and there's probably that. layers and it's prophecy, yeah. it's prophetic, yeah. it's going to carry on um, mm -hmm. into the future. And I think we're going to see this. 
Okay, we're going to move on from that, but I think this is powerful because I want you to get a hold of that for yourself in this Torah portion. That where are you? Where ultimately um, are you getting your blessing from? Is it your career? Is it your family? Ultimately, you have to be like Jacob, say, yeah. Lord. I want what you have for me. Yes. I'm not going to let you go until you what? Bless, Bless me. me. Okay. Yeah. And so we learned something also from what we read about Jacob that I never had seen before. And because he says, it, mm. he said, when I crossed over and I crossed over and to find my wife, you know, my father and mother, they sent me when I crossed over, he says specifically, when I left Beersheba, I did not have anything but my staff. Yeah. And I think this is interesting because I'm thinking, okay, do, you, where's the blessing you left with? Where you were, you yeah. stole or took the blessing of the, uh, uh, you stole the birthright. Uh, you, you, Isaac blessed you, your father blessed you more than one time. But yet he says, when I left. Yeah, he, he only left with the staff. And I think this is very mm -hmm. interesting. I was like, okay, where is the blessing? If he stole the birthright, if he's, and maybe what this whole passage is trying to tell us in his confrontation with Esau is like, you thought I stole something from you, but I really, I left with nothing. Right, right. I didn't, I didn't have, I mean, I, yeah, I had my father bless me, but when I went to, remember when he gets to the well and sees Rachel, he cries. One of the explanations of his crying is he's crying because I have no money to marry this woman. Right, I have right, nothing. Right. Okay. Mm. Let's keep reading. So I, I love this. Genesis 32, 14. So he stayed overnight there. Then from all that had come into his possession, he took an offering for Esau, his brother, 200 female goats, Billy goats, 200 ewes, Rams, These are 30 all numbers, mil oh, I'm way. sorry. I thought they were, I'm I sorry. You, he, you have to understand, he write, makes this so big that I can't tell what's the scripture and what's the number. Okay, 30 milking cows with their young, and then cows, bulls, 40 cows, feet, 40 cows 10. 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, and 10 male donkeys. Okay. <laughs> if you count the, the different types of animals, you will see that there are nine different groups of animals mm -hmm. and that's what he put the space in between he actually gives esau a mincha offering it, in, and we might not have seen it if some translations won't say that they might say it's a gift but in the hebrew it's the mincha offering it's the same offering that cain, uh, cain and abel would have offered um and it, and so he's i think this is powerful he's the offering is letting Esau know. See, it's one thing to say you're sorry. Right. But see, in, in, the, in the Hebrew mindset, yeah. you don't just have reconciliation by saying you're sorry. There ha has to be, recom be uh, you have to be recompensed for what you lost. So what he's actually doing is like, you. Uh, I know you think I stole your birthright and I did, I stole your birthright and I did. I didn't leave with anything, but when I was with Laban, mm -hmm. God blessed me. Yeah. This is all that God blessed me with. Now I'm giving you an offering. I'm giving you a gift. It's the Minka offering. Um, I, I believe it really, it points to, it's a peace offering. Yeah. It's a Shalom offering. You say, yeah. Pastor Dan, how do you know that? Because later on, you're going to see that when he, um, when he's in Sukkot, he arrives there, he leaves there in Shalom. I think the reason he has Shalom is because he, get, and I think one of the reasons why you have the Shalom offering in the, mm -hmm. in, the, in the Old Testament was that you would be peace, not only with God, but you would have peace with your brother. Yeah. Okay. So I think the offering is proving and it's just something to think about. I, I think it's worthy that we think about this, that we realize that God doesn't want us just to say our sorry, but if we did somebody wrong and we right. have the power to pay it back, we, we should do it. Look at Matthew 23 through 26. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering upon the altar and, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go first and be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent while you are with him on, on the way. Otherwise, your opponent may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the assistant, and you will be thrown into the prison. Amen, I tell you, you will never get out of there until you have paid back the last penny. Okay, I can see in this 
story that Jesus is telling, mm. I can see how it could apply to Jacob and Esau. I can see how Jacob is presenting an offering to his brother because he wants reconciliation and, and he's, he understands somehow I have got to pay back yeah. my brother. Yeah. And it basically says, I'll tell you, if you don't do this, he says, you'll never get out of there until you pay back. You're going to have either way that you're going to pay. Right. You're going to pay. So you might as well <laughs> do it. You know, might do it the right way. Um, hallelujah so he was reminding god of his word he did the he did all the natural and he did the the spiritual things that he should have done to reconcile with brother with his brother and now let's see what happens let's look in genesis 33 and what keep reading the story let's see if it works out well then jacob glanced up and saw behold there was esau coming and 400 men with him so he divided the children among leah rachel and the two female servants he put the female servants and their children first, then Leah and her children behind them, then Rachel and Joseph behind them. But he himself passed on ahead of them, and he bowed to the ground seven times until he came near his brother. But Esau ran to meet him, hugged him, fell on his neck, and kissed him, and they wept. His eyes glanced up, and he saw the women and the children, and he said, who are these with you? The children whom God has graciously given your servant, he said. Then the female servants approached, they and their children bowed down. Leah also approached along with her children and they bowed down. And finally, Joseph and Rachel approached and bowed down. What do you mean by this whole caravan that I've met? So he said, to find favor in your eyes, my Lord. But Esau said, I have plenty. Oh, my brother, do keep all that belongs to you. Yet Jacob said, no, please, if I have found favor in your eyes, then you will take my offering from my hand. For this is the reason I've seen your face. It is like seeing the face of God and you've accepted me. Please take my blessing that was brought to you because God has been gracious to me and because I have everything. So he kept urging him until he accepted. So on that day, Esau returned on his way to Seir, but Jacob searched journey to Sukkot and built a house for himself and for his livestock. He made booths. This is the reason the place is called Sukkot. Okay. So there's really a lot going on in this, in this story and I appreciate Pastor Lisa reading it. One of the things that if you trace the blessing that Isaac actually gave to Esau after, remember Esau didn't get the firstborn blessing because right. of the deception. You will see that everything Jacob is doing is basically validating Esau. Mm -hmm. He's bowing down seven times to him. He's calling him master. He's, he's calling him Lord. He's, he's asking him for. Hear me right now. Okay. Can you guys hear me? I just want to make sure I, uh, all right. I can hear you now. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, I, I saw that my internet just shut down. Of course, <laughs> we know how, we know what's going on. Um, so, so Jacob is doing everything he can to let Esau know mm -hmm. that what God had promised you, Esau, um, I'm in agreement with. And right. he, and, and, and then J, uh, Esau, when Jacob tries to give him these things, mm -hmm. he basically says, no, uh, um, and he, he says, oh, my brother, this is very powerful. He says, I already have plenty. Oh, my brother, do keep all that belongs to you. The rabbis actually say when he said that to, to Jacob, he said, Jacob, I recognize the blessing on you. Mm -hmm you didn't really steal anything from me. Mm, that's great. I'm validating who you are. You now he did take the offering because mm -hmm. it, and he did, uh, he, he received it because, because it was right. Now think about this. When they greet each other, Esau kisses his neck. Mm -hmm. That was the same neck that previously the last time he saw his brother, that his brother had the goat skins on his neck and he had on his neck also the the coat that Esau had his mom gave uh, Jacob the coat I'm talking about in the deception he this but now Jacob and Esau they embrace and Esau kiss uh, kisses his neck 
But here's the thing. The rabbis say, <laughs> the rabbis say, it's interesting. The rabbis say that the kiss is not really sincere. Mm. And Esau really wanted to bite his neck, you know, but, but somehow he couldn't do it. I mean, there's a lot of stories about that. But I want, and, um, and so th then Esau, Esau says, hey, let me go with you. I'm going to send some, some people with you. And, 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 and Jacob actually says, um, you go to Seir. And Jacob says this. He says, I'm coming to Seir. I'm going to come see you. Now, in his lifetime, Esau never, I mean, Jacob actually never goes to Seir. Mm -hmm. It's not that he was lying, but it was actually like he was prophesying of a future day mm. because in the scripture, in the book of our Torah portion, in the prophet portion of Obadiah 121, um, Israel is going to go to Seir and yeah, rule over and Seir. Rule over them, and it's yeah. also in Isaiah 35. But so it's interesting. But here's what I was thinking. OK, is the kiss was the kiss sincere? Was it? I think at the time it could have been sincere. But then if you now think about that, let's mm. bring that to the New Testament. Yep. Read Luke 22, 40. This is what popped in my mind. While Yeshua is speaking, suddenly a crowd came and the one called Judah, one of the 12, approached Yeshua to kiss him. But Yeshua said to him, Judas or Judah, with a kiss, you betray the son of man. So even Jesus mm -hmm. was what? Betrayed right. with yeah. a kiss and the rabbi said mm. and, and one of the main reasons they actually would would actually say this and i gave you a lot in the notes i give you the note, uh, notes on it and and, and the, the links to it you can look at look up some of the things but one of the reasons they actually say that is because over the word kiss the hebrew word for kiss is these strange dots like and it's not very rarely do you have dots and so it's like all these little dots over the Hebrew word. Mm. And they say when that, when you see that in the Torah, that's usually pointing to something that you need to figure out or dig out. Something's not as it seems. Okay. So yeah. that's where they would get that. Okay. So even though um, maybe he didn't, maybe it wasn't sincere. Jacob was smart enough, wise enough to say, mm -hmm. okay, we've reconciled but we can't walk together. Right. And right. look at, and you think about that. Does not Ecclesiastes say this? Mm -hmm. Two cannot walk together, what? Unless they are agreed. Three. Remember, Esau's not walking mm -hmm. in the Torah. Mm -hmm. He's not following Elohim. He married Hittite. I mean, he married strange wives. I mean, this guy is known for, you look in the Murder. New Testament, he yeah. says he's a fornicator. He's a, he's a murderer. Yeah, all those things. So mm -hmm. now he leaves Esau and look where he goes in Genesis 33, 18. Look what it says. Jacob arrived in Shalom to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Paradaram and camped right in front of the city. So as soon as he leaves Esau, the Bible says these, you have these strange words. It's, now, again, it's not always in the translations that many people read. You're not going to see. Now, I gave you, I think the Tree of Life version, I gave you it, which is, it actually says he arrived. So in other words, when he left Esau and did what was right, he arrived in Shechem. And when he was in Shechem, he came whole. Mm -hmm. Shalem in the Hebrew, peace wholeness safety actually the rabbis give you a commentary on it they say everything he gave to esau he had already gotten back mm -hmm. it was like multiplication because he did what was right so yeah. I, I think this is like what god is trying to do what god's trying to say when you do what's right yeah, god will restore you. you'll yeah. come into wholeness i think we really when you think about it can you really be whole when you don't reconcile mm -hmm. with your brother I think God was giving us a, a clue to say, this is right. Okay. That's good. Look in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Now may the God of Shalom himself make you completely holy and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept complete, blameless at the coming of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. Okay. So first, Jacob leaves Esau. He's actually, the Bible says he goes right to Sukkot. He goes to a place called Sukkot. And it's there that he's basically made whole. He's in shalom. Even he's no longer limping on his thigh. Actually, that went away the moment the sun went up. Healing arise, rose when the sun ran up in, in his life. Um, but what is this stopover in Sukkot? It's pointing to a day 
that we're going to always live in shalom. We're going to yeah. live in an eternal Sukkot, if you will. Now, a Sukkot is a temporary dwelling and a house. Um, it's a time, Sukkot, the holiday, it's a time when everybody's welcome in the house. Mm -hmm. It's so, okay. So, and when Israel leaves Egypt, you'll see that they leave uh, they leave Egypt, uh, uh, Ramses, which is Goshen. They, their first stop is Sukkot. God was saying, um, I'm going to give you Shalom. I'm going to give you Shalom. But yes. it's like, I was like, I'm, but he's also saying this is like, you, you, um, oh, there's a scripture I love. It says like, like at the, when, when you're at the, when you're at the beginning, God already said, it's already, you're already at the end. I've already completed everything. I've already taken care of you. Just so I, I'm not saying it the right way. I'm not saying, looking for a word, but I can't, I can't think about it. Okay. But in Sukkot, I want you to think about it. Look how animals, he says, he gave animals booths to dwell in. What were the booths? Place of shade, a place of covering of food protection and kindness if you will this is part of the torah way being merciful being people of grace loving kindness even to the least of these even to the animals wait a minute even to your esau yeah. esau was came out of the womb like a look like an animal but i think god is doing something mighty in jacob's life but it's also yeah. prophetic going to sukkot first he leaves, he leaves Esau, he goes to Sukkot first. This could also be pointing to Messiah's birth because Messiah mm -hmm. was born in a Sukkot. He was laid in a feeding trough for animals. Okay, I want to read something because I think I was tying some things together. I think they make sense to me. They might not make sense to you, but mm -hmm. look in Amos 9, 11 about what God said will happen in the last days. Because I think everything what was going on was prophetic as well. In that day, I will raise up David's fallen Sukkot and I will restore its breaches, raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in days of old so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations called by my name. It is a declaration of Adonai, the one who will do this. I think this is so amazing. God says, so he, Jacob stops in Sukkot. He's whole in Sukkot. He builds, uh, you know, these booths for his livestock. And, and, and then he says, in the, in the last days, God says, I'm going to, and he doesn't, I don't, God didn't have to use this word. I'm going to raise up David's, David's fallen Sukkah. He could have said, I'll, I'll, I'll raise up the, te the temple. He didn't say that. Mm -mm. I'll raise up the Sukkah. And so here he's in Sukkot. He builds Sukkah for his animals. And, and, and God says, in the last days, I'm going to raise up that phone. But look what, look what it's tied to. Why, do, why am I going to rebuild the Sukkah? So they may possess the remnant of Edom. Yeah. Edom is Esau. So almost God is showing Jacob. It's like, yeah, you bowed seven times. That's the last time you'll bow to, to Esau. Right, right. You gave him these mint cut gifts. This is the last time. Yeah. Why? Because one day I'm showing you in Sukkot that I'm going to restore, I'm going to rebuild, and you're going to possess Edom. Yeah. I think it's just so powerful. Okay. Yeah. From there, we know we just read he goes to Shechem. Shechem in the Hebrew means shoulder. It's it could be a place of authority. You'll see that going on. Um, and I think I'm going to, I'm going to try to go fast if I can, but one of the reasons he's goes to Shechem, I believe, uh, again, you never see God tell him when he left Laban's house, I want you to go to Sukkot. I want mm -hmm. you to meet Esau. I want you to go to Shechem. God doesn't specifically say these things. Maybe somehow he felt he needed to do it, but I, we don't know. But one of the things I, one of the reasons I think he did go to Shechem mm -hmm. is because Abraham's first stop after God called him was, was Shechem. Yeah. The place of shoulder or the place of authority. Remember, yeah. Isaiah says the government will rest it's on his Shechem, yeah. on his shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he had to retrace those steps of his yes. grandfather. Okay. I, apparently, to possess. apparently, yeah. apparently, I'm not going to say it's right or wrong because I, we don't know. I'm just saying it seems like he's following that pattern yeah. of his father, uh, his grandfather Abraham. So let's 
Let's read there, Genesis 12, 6. And Abraham passed through the land into the place of Shechem, into the plain of Morah. And the Canaanite was, was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed I will give this land. And there built he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Shechem means shoulder. Okay, so when he's in Shechem, that's when God said, I'm going to give you this land. Yeah. And he builds an altar to the Lord. Now, let's look at Jacob. Let's see how his journey is mirroring, mirroring his grandfather's. Look in Genesis 33. When Jacob came from Padan Aram, he arrived safely in the peace at the city of Shechem in the land of Canaan and camped in front of the walled city. Then he bought the piece of land on which he had pitched his tent from the sons of Hamar, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. There he erected an altar and called it Elo, Elo, is Elohi, Israel. So he's mirroring his, his grandfather bought land from the Hittites to bury, um, uh, and now Jacob buys land from the Hivites. I mean, yeah. it's almost like mirror. He, uh, uh, Abraham builds an altar there. Jacob, Jacob builds, builds an, an altar, altar there. Okay. Yeah. So Hivites, think of, there's really interesting stuff about Hivites. Hivites were villagers and they were only concerned of how to enhance their status or the economy of their village. Um, later on, I, I did some even deeper study and I, and I have it, I think I have it here later, but they actually, um, they would, they, one of the, one of the, the studies on the, the Hivites words, it actually comes from the word snake or serpentine. Mm. There's some, and they're, 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 it's, it's very, mm -hmm. they're people who are like about the earth and they're not nice people. They're so one thing about the snake. What do we know about the serpent? Serpent. He he's, twists, a, he's, 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 he's a thief. So I think we're going to see that. Okay. Genesis 36, two. Okay. Wait, yeah. So you'll see that Jacob, um, excuse me, Esau later, you're going to see that Esau actually marries people from this territory. Mm -hmm. He married. That's why I said he had to separate from from his brother because he actually married mm -hmm. these Hivites and, and and even the Hittite he married both of them yeah okay a deception wow so when Shechem um so it's interesting the name is Shechem but the there's a uh, there's a son named Shechem Shechem took he takes Dinah he's a he's the son of Hamar the prince of Shechem and, and his name is Shechem as well. And he lays with her. The Bible says he loves her and he wants to marry her. And apparently Shechem seems to be sincere and he's willing to pay any price, uh, whatever it costs to be with Dinah. So Jacob's sons deceitfully told Shechem and his father Hamar, they've got to be circumcised. Um, but Genesis 34 says this, because remember, Hivites are deceivers, right? But now look what's going to happen when you operate in deception. What's usually going to happen? You're, you're going to get this. You're going to get this. So look what Genesis 34 13 says. And the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamar, his father, deceitfully and said, Because he hath defiled Dinah, their sister. So they, they said, Listen, just get circumcised and everything will be okay. Mm -hmm. But it was deception. But the other part of that is this the sons were negotiating really without honoring the father they shouldn't even been doing they like overruled their father somehow okay. jacob's not negotiating the sons are saying get circumcised um and they're also dealing decept in deception now remember didn't jacob just have an encounter with an angel or a messenger and get a name change it's like i'm not gonna i'm not, I'm not gonna, gonna do, do this. this we're not yeah. gonna deceive these people Right. So this is why maybe Jacob is silent, maybe because he's not in agreement. Maybe so like you're 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 being like how I used to be. I'm not that person anymore. Right. Um, so at the end of the story, I think you you know what's going to happen is they're going to get circumcised on the third day. Um, Levi and Simeon are going to come in when the when those uh, those uh, yeah. Hivites are are in the worst pain of their life. They say the third day after circumcision. I mean, these aren't young guys. They 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 did it willingly because they had their own motives in mind. But mm. Simeon and Levi killed them, and then later in the blessing, when you read the blessings of Jacob over his sons. He says specifically over Simeon and Levi, he said, my soul was not united with them 
and that and, and and that was this and and I will not honor that he did and he, he's basically saying it's the first mention of the word honor in the Bible and it's used in a neg I, I did not honor that because I'm not a deceiver right right and I think this is so powerful I mean just because you can do something just because you yeah. used to do something and it worked a certain way doesn't, doesn't mean, mean if mm-hmm. that's not who you are now if that's not God's you know we're learning there's a Torah way there's a way of the world and there there's a way of the kingdom mm-hmm. and there's a way of the world the way of the world can do anything, but you can't do that. Jacob couldn't do it, right. but his sons were reverting to the old Jacob. Jacob instead of, okay. And so here was their, here was the thinking of the Hivites. Look in Genesis 34. This is what they said. They said to them, we cannot do this thing and give our sister in marriage to one who is not circumcised because that would be a disgrace to us, but we will consent to you only on this condition, if you will become like us in that every male among you consents to be circumcised. Okay, so that's what, I'm sorry, I, I, we didn't need to read that because mm-hmm. that's what the brother said, you gotta be circumcised. Um, and so it looks like, remember, the one son, even though he raped Dinah, he, his motives were probably more pure than the rest of the city in getting circumcised. Right. Yes, of um, course. And I gave you the, all the information well, there. Well, the reason they the city even agreed to it in that next verse is because they that's, knew that's they what I recognized. Read. That's what I want okay, to read. So read, read it. Genesis 34, 23. This is the real reason yeah, the city they agreed it. to be circumcised. Yeah. Will not their cattle and their possessions and all their animals be ours if we do this? Let us consent to do as they asked, and they will live here with us. And every Canaanite man who went out of the city gate listened and considered what Hamar and Shechem said, and every male who was a resident of that city was circumcised. So look what it says. It says, it was all about very, money. Will not their cattle <laughs> yeah. and their possessions. And remember, Jacob's very rich. They yeah. see the blessing yeah. on him. And now they say, if we just become a, I'm going to show tell you in a second, if we become like one of them and we get circumcised, mm-hmm. then then he says basically, they're going to th- they're um it actually says. And all their animals be ours. Right. In other words, we're going to mix with them. And once we mix with them, we're going to get every blessing, everything Jacob and those kids have. Now, here's the thing. This story can show us that you don't even accept the Lord for right. selfish reasons. That's right. That's right. You That's don't right. become a Christian. I want to become a Christian because the, there's a blessing or uh, that's not the reason Mm-mm. you don't join with God's people for what you're going to get. Now think about a lot of people have been preached the gospel. That's not the real right motive for accepting the Lord. Right. Will you be blessed? Absolutely. But they'll also, you'll also go through some stuff. They're not going to tell yes. you that part, Yes. but you don't because many people think that if they just mix and do well what do we need to do they said well just be circumcised but remember the scripture mm-hmm. says in second corinthians 6 14 look what it says look what it says do not be unequally bound together with unbelievers do not make mismatched alliances with them inconsistent with your faith for what partnership can righteousness have with lawlessness or what fellowship can light have with darkness? You know, the other thing I was going to just <laughs> you can say, go ahead. What I was thinking about is that, you know, in Shechem, when they said, you know, let's just do this, let's just get circumcised. I actually thought of the whole situation, what was going on in the early church where um, the, 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 the believers, the Gentile believers were coming in and the religious were saying, they were basically saying the same thing. If you want to be with us, you must be circumcised. Problem being though, that Paul, when he, he wanted to make sure that they just didn't go out and get circumcised, that there there was a a heart heart change first. First. It has to be. Yes. So this is actually the model to show you what the wrong way is yes. because the wrong way is just go through the physical right. conversion because obviously they really at their heart did they want to become god's people no. did they want to worship yahweh no. no they didn't want that they wanted the blessing and so in acts chapter 15 when they deal mm-hmm. with this 
when they deal with the all the nations and Gentiles coming into faith, one of the things they they're arguing with, they are they're they're they are are arguing because this has been a debate from the time of Abraham. Yeah. When somebody comes to faith, what is the what is the first thing they need to do? That was the question. What should they do first? Should they be physically circumcised? Should they be water immersed in water? Should they learn right. some basic premises of the Torah? Mm -hmm. What should they do? So in Acts 15, the council gets together and they say, listen, mm -hmm. the first thing they should do is not circumcision. Now, later you'll see Paul circumcises Timothy because Timothy had knowledge of God's ways. He, he, he was, um, he would grown up knowing God's ways, but it wasn't the first thing he did. So, right, so right. Acts 15 says, first, let them learn not to, not to worship idols. Mm -hmm. Then let's teach them. They can't enter into fornication. Then let's teach them about the, the how to, how to eat clean and, and not have this, not, um, uh, strangled, strangled, strangled and, and, and not to eat blood, which is part of idol an adult. You have to teach them about that because they don't right. know these things. And then at, at, after they say that, they said, then afterwards, we let's not forget every Shabbat, they're going to learn Moses. They're going to learn Torah. Yeah. And so it's only after that process that they said, okay, then there will come a time they might be ready. Right. Or they might say, you know what? I don't want this. And what I didn't I didn't know that that following God meant mm -hmm. all this. Exactly. I like I like the ways of the world. Right. And so this is so this and actually I this gave you is, all that. Yes, this is the model. This is the that. model mm. that of how to assimilate into yeah. God's congregation. Their first really you can even see even and this is Old Testament. There was always a circumcision of the heart. First, yeah. That was the first thing you can see. And then actually it, some people say circumcision of the heart is in the old Testament. Yes. It's in the old Testament. It circumcision of the flesh was done on the eighth day for, for the children. Yeah. But those coming into the faith from the nations, they had to first have a heart transformation. And if yes. they didn't do it, if they did like this situation, they'll find out later that it was a big, a big mistake. And it was. Okay. Well, that's exactly what I was thinking about. Even when you were talking about Jacob, when he was wrestling with um, the messenger and, and how, when you read that dialogue, it, it's so, it runs so close to when you're born again, it's because so your soul is saying one thing, your spirit is saying, yes, yes, I want this. I want this. But there's a, there's a wrestling going on for your spirit, for you as a person. Yeah. And, you know, I think that too many times we, we um, just, we've cheapened the gospel. I know I say yeah. this a lot, but the gospel has been cheapened to the point where we just tell people, just, just close your eyes and okay. pray this prayer. And there's no heart transformation, but without a heart transformation, you cannot be born again. It's not going to work because you're going to fall back. You're going to, you're going to um, have a feel good moment. And then the first trial, the first temptation, you're going to just walk away from it. So to me, watching Jacob, like you brought that, I love that point you brought out. Could it have been his soul, his spirit wrestling, wrestling, wrestling? I just had a picture of that is exactly what happens when we are, are, going through the process of being born again, of and really and surrendering even, and ourselves. Even, and even uh, it's kind of almost continual because yes. you still have to submit, you know, yes. to submit to God, resist the devil. You have to still submit your will. You have to submit your, yes. your soulless realm, your appetite, your emotions, your desires, your intellect. you got to submit it to, to what God's word says. And, and it's continual. It's not a one-time thing. And Paul brings out the same thing. When I do yeah. good, I, 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 when I, when I want to do good, I can't, what, when he says, what, there's a war going on with me. It, he's basically, he's showing you the Jacob and Esau yeah, apart so now. Powerful. And then he says, but he says, what, through Yeshua, we have the victory. We do yes. have the victory. And when we have the whole, and I think the whole key is having a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. Yes. And I think that's, that's, that's key. And uh, anyway, so let's let's we're gonna try to bring it to a close. So so afterwards they they looted the city. They took really 
I think unjustly, and I think there's mm -hmm. going to be a price to pay in the future of Israel because it it seems like everything that the patriarchs and the and the individual sons do, mm -hmm. it gets played out later yeah. as a nation. Right. So when you and I think about it, even in your own life, what you do might in a small way, the next generation is, and we always say that you know what 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 one generation does in moderation, the next generation does what in excess. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're going to have to learn how to bring their soulish Soul. realm yeah. um, and start honoring what God says honor. Okay. So now he's, he's, he, he's in Shechem. He, he got to Shechem. Think about this. Here's what's so sad. When he arrives in Shechem from Sukkot, the Bible says he was in Shalom, but once he's there, it's not. And here's what, oh God, I, I'm just going to have to tell you this. And I was studying it today. One of the reasons they say that he had trouble is because, again, he delayed going to Bethel and pay his vows. He told God, he said, God, if you bring me back. And God said, go back. And, 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 and he didn't go back. And because he delayed and he did this stopover point, his daughter gets raped. Um, raped. There's and now he's, he's saying now. Yeah, there's murder. There's all kinds of stuff. He says. So look right after this. Look in Genesis 31. I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar, and where thou vowest a vow unto me. Now arise, get thee out from this land, and return unto the land of thy kindred. So I want you to know that scripture that I just read, God said to him right before he led, left Laban. I'm the God of Bethel. Where you mm -hmm. and, he, and he says, get out of this land. And what did he say? Go to the land of your kindred. And for some reason, he's not doing he it. Delayed. He's not going to his father. He's not seeing his mother. He stops over with, for his brother. Um, or actually, he doesn't even get to his brother. His brother comes to him because he sends the angels or messengers. But it's just, I'm just wondering, is like, if he wouldn't have did done these delays, mm -hmm. maybe he wouldn't have had this trouble. And I'm thinking... Well, could this also be why many times we as believers are having troubles? It's not really God. It's because God told us to do something. And we're, what are we Delayed. doing? We're delaying. And even when he's in Shechem, his mother actually dies. He had uh, almost two years. He, he's, he's almost, they say he's about two years between Sukkot and Shechem. He's two years. Yeah. He could have been, right. it's 22 years already. 20 years he left Laban. Two years he's not where not where god said mm. Mm. and uh, just read that james 4 13 listen those of you who are boasting today or tomorrow will go to another city and spend <laughs> some time and go into business and make heaps of profit but you don't have a clue what tomorrow may bring for your fleeting life is but a warm breath of air that is visible in the cold only for a moment and then vanishes instead you should say our tomorrows are in the Lord's hands. And if he is willing, we will live life to its fullest and do this or that. I think this is an example for mm -hmm. us before we just go out and do something. We say, let me stop over here. Let me make a pit stop over here, start a business. Whatever it is, we need to ask, Lord, ask what's Lord. your will? Because if he wants you to do it, he'll let you know. Yeah. And I think, and that again, the Holy Spirit, you'll hear a word behind you saying, this is what, this is the way Isaiah says. 30, I think it's Isaiah 30, when you walk to the right or the left. So now, when all this trouble happens, he realizes, yeah. Look in Genesis 35, we're, we're almost, we're going to bring it to a close. Look what he says. God yeah. says to Jacob, go up to Bethel and live there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you in the distinct manifestation when you fled years ago from Esau, your brother. Then Jacob said to his household and to all who are with him, get rid of the idols and images of foreign gods that are among you and ceremonially purify yourself and change into fresh clothes. Then let us get up and go up to Bethel and I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I've gone. So they gave Jacob all the idols and images of the foreign gods they had and the rings which were in their ears worn as charms against evil and Jacob buried them under the oak tree near Shechem. As they journeyed there was a great supernatural terror sent from God on the cities around them. And for that reason, the Canaanites did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, and he and all the people were with him. And there he built an altar to worship the Lord and called the place El Bethel, God, the house of God. So finally, God says to him, 
hey, listen, get where you need to be. Yeah. He's so clear. Go to Bethel. Now think about it. Where are all those idols coming from? Shankum. Maybe they wouldn't have any of those idols. Right. Okay. But here's the cool thing. When they did purify the camp, the Bible, and they got rid of it, the Bible says that God put a fear mm -hmm. on the other nations and then, and they, they wouldn't attack them. And it, that's exactly what happened when the children of Israel left Egypt, God put a fear yeah. on the other nations and they yeah. wouldn't touch. And I think God is telling us something also. When we purify, get yeah. the idolatry. And remember, first thing Acts 15 says to the, to the nations that are coming to Messiah, you, get, you the get the idolatry. Out. The first thing is idolatry, then it's adultery. And they're almost one and the same, but one's with, one's with, with God's, uh, gods and one's with not. With they're both kind of <laughs> gods, but it, anyway. All right. So I think this is, this is a model for us. Again, when we, okay, when we do what's right, mm -hmm. God says, go to Bethel. And he recognized, I can't go to Bethel unless I get rid of this idolatry. Look what's going on. He buries it under the tree. Yes. We bury it under the cross. Hallelujah. Yes. And we, all right. And then God puts a fear on your enemies and they can't touch you. Hallelujah. Genesis 35, 9 says, and God appeared unto Jacob again. I think this is amazing. He doesn't just appear one time. He doesn't say just arise and go to Bethel. He comes again to him. Mm -hmm. um, and it says, when he came out of Padan Aram and he blessed him, the word Padan Aram, as I close, it was, it's mentioned in the Bible 29 times. Mm -hmm. Every time it's mentioned, it's mentioned as a double. Very interesting. This word in the Aramaic could mean a garden or a mm -hmm. field. I'm wondering if somehow God is using this word to point to another kind of garden that he has for his people i don't know now let's 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 oh my god i have so much scripture baby what am I, okay read this Just last talk about it. okay so when god appears to him again and he blesses him then he confirms his name one more time he says now your name is no longer jacob your name is Israel. And he just blesses them again. But there's something, there's something interesting in verse 13 when he says that. He says, I'm going to give you the land. I gave to, I mean, he's basically get, confirming the, the covenant. He's confirming everything he told Abraham. He's telling Jacob now it's for you. This is another encounter. But there's something so interesting. This is the encounter at Bethel. Remember, Bethel is a place last week that he's put his head on a rock like, and he lays down like a pillar. And then somebody said to me after I preached, they said, you know, when we lay down, maybe that's symbolic of we need to lay our lives down as an offering. We need to lay our life. And I was like, yeah, he's laying his life down. And that's when he gets that visitation. But here's one thing. He saw the angels ascending and descending and either on him or on the ladder. But now in this visitation, you don't see angels. Mm -hmm. Now it's God and Jacob. Yeah. And verse 13 says, and God went up from mm -hmm. him. Yeah. This is so amazing. It's the <laughs> same word, Ola. Just like the angels ascended on the ladder or ascended on him. Now God said, God ascended on him. I think this is this is showing you Jesus as the Holy Spirit comes and rests yes, on him like yes. a dove. God ascended. It, he rested and then he ascended on him. And he, he's communing with God. And where is it at? He's, it's at Bethel. Mm -hmm. I, I can just so much more. I, I was like, I feel so bad that I was like, I'm going so long tonight because it's such an amazing story. Because at the end of the story, he he builds that this altar and he has an encounter with God, but then he leaves, and as he's journeying, his beloved wife, mm -hmm. Rachel, dies. Yeah. On the way to Bethlehem. So I, anyway, I'm going to stop there. You look at the notes and you see what I said about it. But I think there's just so much richness. I, I don't have time. And unfortunately, apparently I'm not speaking this Shabbat. So <laughs> somebody can pick up on, on anything that we've, uh, in any comments or you can pick up on it. But you'll see what we're reading in the Torah. If you haven't figured it out yet, the Torah 
is the foundation of the prophecy. Yeah. The prophets, it's the heart. The prophets will put legs on it. When yeah. you get to the New Testament, that's when the wings, that's when you soar. But there's so much amazing stuff um, in this story of Jacob. I know yeah. it's, I know you, it's amazing because yeah. it's, it's pointing to Messiah. It's actually pointing to Messiah. All right. Praise God. Um, we're going to stop the recording. We're going to ask you.